Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for this Bible study. We really appreciate your interest in biblical ideas, spiritual teachings, um, the Word of God. And we hope that we can help you to factor it into your life. One of the greatest things about the Word of God is that it tells us how to live as His children. And if the more we study, the more we understand, the more application we see it within our lives. Let's bring everyone into the study today. It's good to see everyone. We are missing Brendan, um, but hopefully next week we'll have him back and we'll have half of a baker's dozen, sort of. Missing one half of a person for half of a baker's, yeah, a baker's dozen. dozen. A baker's dozen is 13. Yeah. So if we're missing half of a person. Six and oh, a half. Yeah. 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 Um, so we left off last time we were in our study through the gospel of John. We finished up chapter one and we're about to step into chapter two. Now, if you joined us a little bit early, um, you heard some kind of pre discussion there about a couple of things regarding, uh, Jesus and the cleansing of the temple. And so we'll get into that a little bit later, but we'd like to thank everyone who's joined us. I'm looking at our chat room. Hey, if you would, if this is your first time, if you want to say hello, from the uh, chat on the YouTube live stream. You can do that if you're watching us on a YouTube channel. If you're watching us on a Facebook page, use the comment area there. Say hi, tell us where you're from if you don't mind, just so we'll know who is, who is with us today. If you, are, if you haven't done so, be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us. And on the YouTube side of things, like the video and subscribe. And that way you'll receive future notifications of our study. All right, gentlemen, we're going to start in the first section here. We're looking at what is uh, referred to as the miracle there in Canaan or Cana. And let's go ahead and start our discussion there about that. Um, let's see, Bob, let's start with you. I was looking at last week's video. I don't know if you had a chance to read last week. So we're going to bring you in this week and let's okay. go ahead and read through verse number 12 uh, and kind of get us into this here. All right, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set, uh, set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. All right. And let's go ahead and finish up through 12. Just kind of cap it off there. I'm sorry. Are you good? Uh, the, the, this beginning of science, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. And they did not stay there many days. All righty. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Let's get ourselves back up to the top of a lot of interesting back to the top of the page. I'll finish my phrase before I jump to another one. A lot of interesting things within this first, at least John's account, first miracle. So let's go ahead and talk about that for just a minute. There was some, like I said, pre-show discussion here. Should we view, is there any evidence or any reason why we should view this as the first public miracle or do you think that maybe there are reasons to think that this may not have been the first public miracle any thoughts 
we talked about a lot this uh, pre-show quite a bit. Um, it does say it's the beginning of his miracles. So anytime somebody says, hey, what was Jesus' first miracle? And somebody says, well, John 2, changing water to wine. I, I certainly wouldn't argue with that because it does start off by saying uh, here in our last verse, uh, verse 11, this is the beginning um, of things. Now, that being said, in the book of John, John goes on a little later in John chapter 4 to talk about Jesus healing a, uh, a, a an authority son, and it calls that the second miracle. And the problem to say that it was the first chronologically, the second chronologically, is that in John chapter 3, it indicates that Jesus performed other miracles between those two. So that kind of leaves us now... now now, one other question we have is whether or not John is meant to be chronological in the order of events, that they're also uh, in order in time. So that kind of could Im indicate, you know, a, a question there. But since John has so few miracles recorded in him, in fact, you, we've talked about this a little bit already, seven miracles performed by Jesus in the book, uh, you, you might, you know, that might be, you know, uh, you know a number that we might, uh, you know, work with trying to understand better. But since there's a limited number of miracles, for sure, it might more be the idea that we're just numbering the miracles as they're appearing in the book of John. John uses miracles as a chief part of his testimony, as he says in John chapter 20, when he tells us that these signs and wonders, Jesus, you know, are, are recorded so that you will believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, telling us that the miracles are actually a little more specific to a, a certain point, the identity of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, you know, and building on that... Uh... You know, um, we brought out in our introductory lessons the number seven, yeah. and there are seven miracles, in, you know, in, in the Gospel of John leading up to the resurrection. Uh, you know, there's actually one that takes place after the resurrection and so on. So you, you've you got the seven miracles. But, but you know, something else to think about here, though, uh, <laughs> reconciling your point, Brian, <laughs> uh, it says this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. Was this the first miracle he did in Cana? Was this the first miracle he did in this region? And, uh, you know, that might be something else to think about as another possibility. But but I, I don't have a problem with the point that you're making when you look at the apologetic nature of uh, of John, the way he uses these sevens. I mean, he, he's very he's very deliberate uh, in, in the points that he's establishing. You know, in Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we are given Matthew's account of the beginning of Christ's ministry. And his ministry did begin in Galilee. But according to many sources, uh, there's at least a year between Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 and Matthew chapter 4, verse 13, during which time he had already been to Galilee and back to Jerusalem and Judea. And so it's possible that this beginning uh, is the beginning of his ministry in Galilee, but he had already had uh, a limited ministry in Judea, according, you know, John chapter four and in uh, verse two and implied also in John chapter three, one through 21. My thinking, this was the first miracle uh, free ministry but also the first miracle uh, uh, begins his ministry officially in Cana. After Jesus, Galilee, uh, according to Matthew uh, chapter uh, ministry. And uh, Matthew even quotes Isaiah chapter nine, verse two as indication that this is the beginning of his ministry as prophesied by uh, by Isaiah. And this is when he began to uh, preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what we have in John chapter 2, and probably uh, at least John chapter 2, is between Matthew 4.12 and Matthew 4.13. And, uh, and so he performs this miracle and then he goes back to Cana of Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. Then there's the Passover. He goes down for that and he remains in Jerusalem for a while okay. and preaches there and performs some signs at least. 
Ryan, that was not the same, but similar to what you're pointing out too. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's a, I actually yeah, misspoke. It's John two, verse twenty three, that indicates yeah. that he performed other signs. So yeah, um, I think it's a good explanation on, on Bob's Fisher what you were saying there um, and lining up lining up with this. Um, what, what I find interesting, and I think the reason why I wanted to ask the question is a little bit later we're going to see what Mary says to them. I've, I've, found, I've often found this interesting. So they're at the wedding feast and they have the problem. They have no wine. So they come to Mary and they tell this to her. Um, you know, there's, there, there's, there's a reason why they came to her. We don't know exactly. Maybe she was over it. There was something she was in charge of, different things like that nature. But the way what she says to Jesus is what I find very interesting. When she approaches him about the issue here, the mothers of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And then verse number five, she says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And it just sounds like he says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. You kind of want to infer from that him about to say, I can't do anything. I'm not going to do anything right now. But she just says, do whatever he says to do. My point is, Mary already knew enough about the situation to say whatever he tells you to do, do, which makes me wonder if like what you're saying, there were things he'd already done before now, you know, that gave her that, the confidence that he could take care of this. If anybody knew that Jesus was born of a virgin, it was Mary. <laughs> well, well, she already knew what the angel told her too at the very beginning of all that. Uh, yeah, uh, of course she knew yeah. she was a virgin. She told the angel. Yeah, yeah. but uh, and she knew that she had not had relations before that uh, birth of Jesus, so she knew he was born of a virgin. Yeah, and that says a lot about the cross. I mean, she could have saved him from the cross if she had not been a virgin when he was born. Yeah, she but, could have just said, "Okay." I was not a virgin. Yeah. But, and but to know that he could, but to know that he had the power to turn the water into wine for her to say, whatever he says, do, you know, she knows. He can, yeah, yeah. She knows. Exactly. Can, she knows he's the son of God. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But it's, it's not his, his ministry has not yet begun. Mm -hmm. That's probably why he was a little reticent. Yeah. But, well, and, and so we can kind of a secret miracle at that point. You, you can tie that statement, my hour has not yet come, to several things that when he would tell them, don't tell anyone, don't let this yeah. be known yet, you know, yeah. All right, any thoughts or comments, especially from you? If you're watching uh, this live, you have an opportunity to let us know what you have to think. If you have any thoughts or questions, you can put them in the Facebook comment area, the comment of this video section. If you're on our YouTube side watching this live, use the chat area. You can also, let me bring this up. I failed to do it earlier. You can send us an email. Send it to questions at Truth Factor Live. If you are watching this at our website, which is truthfactor.com, go to the live viewing page. I now have a comment, an area down a form down at the, beneath the video where you can actually submit a comment that way too. But you can send us a question. We'd love to hear from you, see what you have to think. Um, but coming back to this, any other thoughts or comments, at least leading up to this part of the miracle? Brian. Uh, just real quickly, one more comment about the hour not mm -hmm. yet come. Uh, Jesus will say this seven times. So he'll say in here in chapter two and verse four, my hour's not yet come. He'll say in John chapter seven and verse six, my time is not yet come. Uh, seven verse 30, his hour hadn't come. Eight and verse 20, his hour had not yet come. Then it shifts. Uh, in John chapter 12, verse 23, the hour has come. John 13 and verse 1, his hour had come. John 17 and verse 1, the hour has come. So it's kind of neat that uh, seven statements, uh, three, uh, four of them, the hour wasn't yet, three of them, the hour is, um, that just kind of uh, lead us into it. Again, that's more the idea of Jesus knowing exactly when his time was. Interesting. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. that point. Well, and that would make for a great study because when you study the, the, the ministry of Christ, as we call it, the three years, there is that break point, you know, where he, he stops telling them, don't tell others. And again, there's a reason for that. But then the next thing you know, they are to tell. Yeah. And that Brian, about Interesting. you were kind of right. Uh, the feast of John chapter seven is not called a Passover there. 
but I think that needs to be a Passover in order for there to be three. I see. And I think there, are, I think there, are, uh, there are three Passovers, uh, but I don't know why I remember that, Bob. So I don't know if I'm thinking it is a Passover, but I can't remember why I think there's a third one. We'll find out. We'll look it up. Yeah, we'll study that as we go. Well, that was one of the things I remember hearing. Well, even as at college, we were looking at John, and that was the point made is that dear John uh, lists four different feasts, and the thought is three of those were Passovers. You know where you okay. you could track the three for the three years of his ministry. Um, okay, I've got it. I've got it. In John six and verse four is the second Passover. So okay. here in John two is the first Passover. John six verse four is the second Passover, and of course after John eleven fifty five comes the third Passover. Yeah. Okay. He was crucified. All right. Let's see. Any other thoughts? We'll we'll get into the water pots here in just a moment. Um. So when we go back in Old Testament history, there was a previous event where the water itself was turned into something not water. What was that? Who remembers? Blood. Yeah, yeah. Go all the way back to the 10 plagues and uh, the, the first sign that Moses did that had Aaron do to show that you know they were sent from the God of Israel, from Jehovah. And, you know, this wasn't a little dye put in the water. This wasn't flavoring put in the water here. You know, this is an actual miracle where it becomes something different than what it was. Now, what was odd in this situation here, uh, Paul, what was odd in this situation in regards to the master of the feast when he tasted what they what they brought to him. This is better than what we started out with. It is. No, <laughs> there you go, Paul. Sorry, sorry. Uh, it was better uh, than what they had had at the beginning, uh, and he did not <clears throat> know where it came from. Uh, he says, "Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior." Uh, but he says here, you have kept the good wine until now. Why do you think he did that? Or why do you think that that would be the, the question? I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, why, why would they serve the bad wine <laughs> later into the feast? Um, I don't know. Maybe People's senses dulled. People senses dulled a little bit. That's, that's kind of what comes to my mind is... Uh, you know, they've already been drinking uh, whatever it is they've been drinking so far, and their their sense uh, their their taste buds have dulled a little bit because of what they've been drinking and so on. I'm reminded of the uh, Pepsi challenge uh, back in uh, 1984. I think it was after New Coke came in, and or maybe it was a little before that. Pepsi started challenging people to taste Pepsi and Coke not knowing which was which. And they they would drink one and then they would eat a cracker to get that taste off of their tongue. And then they would drink the other one. It's mm -hmm. a way of cleansing the palate, I think. And and so here, if you serve the, the good wine first, then yes, they're not gonna be able to tell the difference between the good wine and and the not so good wine. But when you go from inferior wine to superior wine, you can taste that. Interesting point. Okay. I remember those days too. <laughs> All right. Anything else on the miracle here in Canaan we want to really kind uh, of talk about? I'll throw, I'll throw one more thought in. I okay. do not think it is telling us that the guests will be drunk and therefore not able to understand the difference because it does not seem likely that a group of devout Jews, devout enough that they're actually ceremonially washing their hands before they go in, are going in there to get schnookered, um, so to speak. That they, uh, this does not seem to be the case that they are describing, uh, you know, that G and, and of course, that is the big question that comes up a lot. Did Jesus just make alcoholic beverage to help people get drunk? Um, 
there could be no way that's the case. You know, even if somebody would defend the idea that Christians and you know could consume alcohol, uh, this would be Jesus creating an intoxicant for intoxicated people. That's outrageous. Uh, you know, gallons. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. So um, I and and one thing about this miracle, I always think is interesting is I like to think, well, how does this tell me that Jesus is the Christ? I kind of think of the idea that, you know, when you're dipping your hands in the in the water to, to be ceremonial pure, the water itself becomes unclean, according to the old law. Uh, there was a statement that says that if, you know, you use something to purify yourself, that thing becomes unpure, um, and what it touches becomes unpure. Jesus is taking what's un, what's impure, what has been made unpure, and is transforming it to something marvelous. I kind of think maybe it's also an analogy for us we're, we're something that's impure that's unclean and he's transforming us by the power of the christ into something marvelous um you know and that of course the image of the wedding feast is one that 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 is used many times in the new testament to describe the kingdom of heaven so i always like to think of that miracle in that sense you yeah know, also, go ahead thomas yeah yeah uh, yeah i was gonna say you know I, i've always you know of, of all the arguments that are made for advocating social drinking uh, they love this one, and they love the Timothy drink a little wine. You know, those are two. Be careful when you use those arguments. I, I mean, be careful of the consequences. You know, I, I'm not willing to make Jesus into a bartender. You know, uh, I mean, because that, that's almost what you have if, if that's the case. You know, I, I mean, consider the fact, you know, I this isn't stated in the text, but, you know, Jesus able to perform a miracle. And by the way, I describe this as a miracle of quality. You know, that's one of the aspects of this miracle is what Jesus made was better than anything else. Jesus being whom he was, why would it not be possible for him to create a wine that tasted better that actually solved your drunkenness? <laughs> you know, you know, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that happened, but 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 the point is is you know this argument about he definitely made uh, you know he definitely made an alcoholic beverage when the people had already well drunk uh, be careful what be careful what you're implying in that that that's not a good justification for this and and, and incidentally um uh, and I know we we don't have the time to deal with this and we're not that's not our purpose here but 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 you've also just got to factor in the differences between the time back then and what people want to justify in doing today, which uh, you're dealing with totally different environments, uh, different time frames, uh, different usages, different abilities and how the wines were processed and all that type of stuff. And so I, you, you just can't use this as an argument for what people want to justify today. A couple of things I want to say at this point. One is that water uh, every day is turned into wine because the water in the soil becomes a soil solution. Uh, the grapevines soak that or pull that soil solution into uh, itself. And then that soil solution uh, produces grapes. And in those grapes is, uh, is wine or grape juice, oinos. Uh, and so uh, that happens. That happens every day. Jesus just took the grapes out. Uh, he took out the soil solution. Uh, but if it was another thing, if it was intoxicated wine, he would have had to not only create grape juice. He would have to create some yeast, something that would uh, cause fermentation. Even though he might speed up the fermentation process. Uh, and so that would that would be two miracles. But again, why would he create 180 gallons of intoxicating beverage if these people have been already drinking alcoholic beverages? And I, I understand that these these feasts oftentimes went over several days. It wasn't just a, a single day, like a, a wedding reception. Right. Let's go. Yeah, let's I jump mean, to the um, let's jump to the comments real quick. Okay, because they, they are relevant now to what we're talking about, um, and I think it's a good point. Let's start with uh, Chris Kramer. 
he says, um, in referencing Isaiah chapter 16, verse 17, he says the term wine is used for fresh juice. Alcoholic content of new wine that is being traded out in the great process is zero. Anything new is fresh grape juice. And then David Clark, he writes, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't know if the wine was fermented or was it actually grape juice? And we're going to cycle back to that here in just a second. James Dodson says he would have made 120 to 180 gallons of alcoholic wine and his mother in attendance. And then uh, back to Chris again, Jesus would have denied the law. Habakkuk 2 verse 15 says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to the bottle, even to make him drunk. So I, I really even, think there's a reasonable argument to think that what Jesus turned the water into was grape juice. Even our law yeah. would arrest a bartender who served drunk people, you know, yeah. uh, which yeah. is which would be what was happening if that was the case. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. Which would explain why it tasted so much better. Um, yeah. There's a fellow, uh, Wines of the Bible, it's an old book or pamphlet, like 1800s or something like that. He basically yeah, makes the point, if memory serves, that the goal would have been something that tasted good. So, you know, fresh juice maintained as long as it could in that fresh state would taste better than something that began the fermentation process. And while grape juice will sour over time, mm -hmm. it won't ferment until you put something in it. That's uh, it. It causes fermentation. And, uh, and so if this wine they've been drinking had been several days old, it may have begun to be a little sour and therefore not and be inferior to fresh wine. And so his wine was fresh. Uh, there was, no souring, much less uh, fermentation. Uh, that to me makes more sense than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, good good thoughts. Appreciate the comments um, in, in the chat area. Thank you so much. Feel free to continue letting us know what you think about things. But I do want to bring up one point that may have been touched on earlier, real quick before we move on. Verse 11, all right? Let me pop back that, pack that, okay. Let me put it on the screen again. <laughs> Sorry. Verse 11 says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of glory and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. You know, this, someone mentioned this a while ago. I think this would have been a quote unquote private miracle. And it would have gone to strengthen the faith specifically of his disciples, the ones that were there at the wedding, because they would have been a witness, witness to this. You know, even something through, as simple as this, yeah. All through okay, the well. gospel, I think all four of them, from time to time, will say, "And his disciples believed in him." Mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to think that well, this is the first time they believed in him because it's already they said it, but they continued to believe in him. Their belief in him was strengthened yeah. as time passed, as they saw more and more miracles. Yeah, That's a good point. All right, any other thoughts on this? Uh, we have him now. He goes down to Capernaum, he and his mother, his brothers and his disciples. So they move on from here to Capernaum and they did not yeah. stay there many days. Go ahead, Tom. Just one real quick comment um, mm -hmm. on, on the miracles. Uh, verse number seven, Jesus said, fill the water pots and it says, and they filled them to the brim. And, and that's a significant statement because John is observing there was no room to add anything else. So, so that's uh, little things like that are recorded about miracles all the time, just to imply that this was not something that happened coincidentally, or there was some natural process that made it happen. It was to the brim. Nothing else could be added to it. And so he said, fill it. They did. They dipped out of it and it was one yeah. instant, instantaneous, a miracle of quality and also a miracle over natural substances. You have content. Yeah. 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 So. Let's see real quick. Um, I'm going to throw this one into everyone to see from the Facebook side of things. Chris truth and reason. Chris Kramer says, funny story. I ordered, I ordered a book of Amazon from Jared Jacobs. He wrote called wine when it was delivered. My Amazon speaker announced wine has arrived. 
Did you thank your driver? <laughs> that would be funny. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's move on then to the next section here. This one, we typically understand this mm -hmm. to be when Jesus cleanses the temple. And let's go ahead and read this section. We'll start at verse 20. Let's read down through verse 22. Paul, would you mind reading that for us? We stopped before at verse 12. You don't want to read 13 through, uh, through 20? We're going to read 13 through 22. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Mr. Paul, if you would, sir. <clears throat> Certainly. Uh, John two thirteen down through John 2, verse 22. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. <clears throat> When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. All righty. Thank you, Paul. There's a lot here within this section that we could, uh, we'll, a lot we need to unpack, but we'll see what time will permit here. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we have this is the introduction of uh, the first Passover, as far as within John's record here. There's a little doubt as to that in the text there. We have Jesus going up to, the, to, the, um, to Jerusalem there. Let's talk about the temple for just a moment. Um, there's a connection between this and Matthew chapter 17. Let me jump over there real quick that I think is interesting, and we'll make that known here in a minute. Matthew chapter 17, later down in the chapter there, he gets, uh, he talks about what would be considered the temple tax or the two drachma tax, I guess. And in that particular instance there, let me pop it up here in a minute. They come to Peter and ask him, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Now there's some, if you go back and do some research into this, this was insti instituted by Moses in the law back in the book of Exodus. It was a yearly tax that was paid by the people, um, everyone 20 and older um, at the time of the census there. And so they come to Peter and ask him if Jesus is going to pay the tax or <laughs> more does he say, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And Peter says, yes. I still haven't figured out what Peter was saying. Yes, he does. Yes, he doesn't. But anyway, Jesus then t says to Peter, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. But he says, nevertheless, so as not to offend, they'll pay the tax there. All right. In this case in point, it sounds like the reason why Jesus is saying they don't have to pay the temple tax is because he's the son. Okay. And as a result of that, the temple belongs to his father. He's the son, his disciples with him, they were exempted from the tax. Now, the reason why I mention that is simply, it relates back to our study because the temple, the reason why he drives the money changers out of the temple is because this was the house of God. And any, any thoughts um, on that there, just as we begin this area? I mean, think about how offensive this was to him. Because not only did he know why the tabernacle was established, because he was God. 
Not only did he know the law regarding it and then the purpose and the use of the temple, but to see his father's house become no different than the temples used to worship idols, you know, as a money making endeavor. Go ahead, Bob. Back in Luke two, when Mary and Joseph apparently for the first time take Jesus to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, When they leave, you know, he's not with them and they discover that. And so they go back and search three days without finding him. Finally, they said, well, let's look in the temple. Well, that's where he has been. And, and uh, he seems to be surprised that, that they don't, that they haven't thought to look there already. Must I not be in my father's house and about my father's business? And yeah. he, he was teaching in the temple uh, and asking and answering questions. And uh, and so, yeah, he, he recognized that from an early, I mean, and I, and, I, and I know sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish between uh, what he knew as God and what he knew as, as, as man. Uh, I want to say that his mind was de- de- deity. He was deity in mind and always knew these things. But still, from a standpoint of, of looking at him as a, as a human being, from an early age, he knew and understood the temple and the purpose of it. And, uh, of course, now we know that he is the son of God. And, uh, yeah, he revered the temple as the place where God, God would meet with the people to uh, give them the, the forgiveness on the on the day of uh, day of atonement, for example, as the blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat, and so. But this is is, and I think this needs to be understood. It is not the temple proper, the holy place, and the most holy place, but the temple compound, because there was the court of the Gentiles, there was the court of the women. Uh, court of the women, the women could go in there, but they couldn't go any further. The court of the Gentiles, they could go in there, but they couldn't go any further. And there was Solomon's portico, which was uh, where Jane, uh, Peter and John were preaching in Acts chapter uh, 2, uh, or Acts chapter 3. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was a very, it was very revered by Jesus. It was a, a house of prayer. This was the whole purpose of it, a place where they could go and worship God. Even in these outside courts, they were to be uh, engaged in very sober activities. Even today, uh, we know about the the Jews that go and uh, wail at the at the West Wall, the Wailing Wall, as it is sometimes called, and they write their prayer requests on these little scraps of paper and they roll them up and put them in the crevices between the the rocks in that in that wall. And somebody is designated to go through there every evening and collect those and, and store them. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a very, uh, this, this is a, a serious place for serious business. Uh, I'm thinking also for the temple tax, you had to use the, uh, the drachmas, uh, the Jewish coinage. You mm-hmm. couldn't use the coinage from your uh, places uh, from Roman Empire. The denarius wouldn't be accepted. It bore the uh, the image of Caesar. And so it seems like there would be a, a legitimate place for the money changers here. But that if they're making his father's house a, a house of merchandise, they're making merchandise of the brethren. And so I'm thinking they're gouging the brethren, uh, not giving a fair rate of exchange in this in this money and probably uh selling inferior animals exorbitant prices and so uh it's it's not just a service that they're offering uh worshipers who have come from so far they couldn't bring their sacrificial animals it's no longer a matter of service to them it's a matter of uh it's a money-making scheme absolutely absolutely um yeah. Um, one more side note on that before we, 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 we move on, unless there's another comment too. It would not be uncommon, think about David, um, the religious leaders of the day, they would refer to, they could refer to the temple as our father's house. 
all right, because God was the heavenly father. But that's not the same as the power behind Jesus' statement, my father's house. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah, not quite the same. When he told the, the women, you go to tell my brethren, I go to their God and my God. Yeah. Their father and my father. Making a distinction between uh, his father being their God and his father being his God. And being his father as opposed to their father. Uh, different relationships. Yeah. Um, Tom, knowing people today, does the behavior of the Jewish leadership, are we surprised that they had turned this into uh, a den of thieves, a house of merchandise? Not at all. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, um, on a monthly basis, I'm preaching through Second Peter and, and uh, uh, one Sunday night a month, and I, I've been dealing with Second Peter too. You know, there were false teachers among the people, even or there were there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. And, and he goes on and he describes their profiteering ways, and 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 the sad reality is, uh, you know, anybody that follows any of these mega television quote unquote ministries uh you know i uh joel osteen yeah okay i'm gonna call out a name uh, joel osteen if, if you watch one of his programs at the end if you would like a copy of this uh you can send a donation or, or something to that effect and I've, I've seen that on numerous occasions selling their sermons uh, and, and selling all kinds of merchandise and so on. So I, I, it's absolutely big business today. Even, and, and how far do you want to take this? I mean, uh, uh, think about the fact that there is a music genre, a quote unquote Christian music. And uh, they sometimes perform in these mega churches and stuff. I, I just wonder, do they charge admission? You know, do, do these bands want to be paid the way that the way that um, a, a rock band or a country band wants to be paid and, and those types of things? So, I mean, yes, it's very much merchandise all over the place. And we need to be careful about that, even ourselves and in our own congregations to make sure we don't become guilty of that. Yeah. Especially the tendency of so many denominational churches having what they call praise teams. Yes. They come in and they perform, basically. And yeah. they, I'm confident, uh, paid for that. And, of course, it's different from paying a gospel preacher to teach you the truth because he's he's spent money to get there. And he's taken time out of his uh, normal routine and uh, his normal work. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's one thing to pay a gospel preacher to preach a gospel meeting. It's another thing to pay somebody to come in and perform for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and when a gospel preacher brings the book that he has written with him. <laughs> you want to go and, there. <laughs> I was yeah, thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and he brings a copy of a set of the books and, and, and he wants to put a table out front. <laughs> hey, uh, and, uh, yeah, books, giving them away. T-shirts. Uh, yeah. 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 The, the Brian all... Haynes biography, you know, the, and I was writing one for Paul too, but I'll put it in the back yeah. of the building. So. Yeah. Are you going to have t-shirts well, with well, your picture on it? I would put those it? in the back of the building. You know what? You know what, uh, Brian? That really wouldn't be an issue because uh, nobody would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. Merchandising. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. A um, couple comments real quick. I'll bring in as we continue. Uh, Rhonda says, makes one think seriously about us being the temple of God. We must not defile ourselves with sin lest we be turned over to Satan. That's a good point. You know, bringing in first Corinthians chapter six in that respect there, um, keeping ourselves pure and clean and not being delivered over, turned over to sin. That's a good point. Uh, let's see, David Clark, he says, it's big business, but it's wrong business. And the religious world has become a money-making endeavor. Now, authors don't always get rich. We understand that, you know, but the fact of the matter is it is a huge money-making endeavor. And then Javon, I'm not sure if I said that right, uh, Jesse, um, he says, uh, greetings from Central, Central Church of Christ, 
Hyderabad, India. And someone else mentioned earlier, I think I forgot to bring this in, um, Hedy Raquel says hi from the Isle of Man. And yes. um, James Dodson's from Missouri. So we have several from around, but thank you so much for your interest in joining us for our study here today and for your comments for sure. Let's see how much time do we have. I uh, started this a little bit late. We'll go over just a little bit. But um, I really want to deal but, with this quotation. Uh, the disciples were made to think by viewing this of Psalm 69 9. Please do. Yeah, please do. Still for your house has eaten me up. He's, he's full of righteous indignation. There's no sin here. Uh, there's no inordinate anger here. It is righteous indignation. And I tell you, I think Christians ought to feel that more than they do and express that more than they do. It's, yeah. it's really just, you know, just turning it back to it and not saying anything. And, and kind of neat. The guy that wrote that psalm didn't have a temple. Uh, it was a psalm of David. The temple hadn't been yeah, built yet. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, David Clark also reminds us that church isn't entertainment. There we go. Church isn't entertainment. It praises God. It's a good point. Yeah, so you know, Dave. Uh, just just to mention, David, welcome. He's been listening for a few weeks. So he's one of our members. Uh, and, and and I believe I'm correct in this. Uh, before he came to us, he, he was he was in a congregation that was caught up in some of this. So uh, uh, so he 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 knows a little bit of the background of it. Is that right, David? He'll well, say yes. Or no. Good. Well, the thing is, all right, churches need money to function. All right, we understand that. Local congregations is a biblical pattern for the members to support the work of the local church there. Clearly biblical. But when the church begins begins to take on works and functions outside of the biblical scope and authority, then they need more money for that. And when you take on work outside of biblical authority, you're going to bring in the money outside of biblical authority as well in order to fund that. And um, if you keep it to what the scriptures teach, then the, the local church is generally, well, should be self-sufficient for whatever local work the local church is doing there. And Tom, he says that is, that is correct there. All right, there was one more point here, I think. I'm trying to decide if we've got the time, if we have the time. Yeah, let's, um, sorry, I'm a little bit indecisive on this point. What are your thoughts? Should we go ahead and come and cover 18 through 22 real quick? Or is that real quick not possible? <laughs> I'd say go ahead. Go ahead Tom had a good comment on it, I think. So yeah, yeah, uh, I'd like I, to hear I, him make it. Yeah, there's some observations to tie into that. Yeah. yeah go right ahead. If, if I can go ahead. Uh, yeah. if, if, uh, basically, the point is, is after they're asking, they ask for the authority. You know, why? Mm -hmm. And what sign are you going to show us? And Jesus said, destroy this temple. Three days, I'll raise it up. What's interesting. And, and then, of course, they respond about the 46 years and all of that. But then John explains in verse 21, he was speaking of the temple of his body. Bear in mind, John's writing much later. And uh, one of the things that was interesting in my study of evidence is, is this expression, destroy the temple in the three days, I'll raise it up. Uh, it is actually, it actually becomes the accusation that the Jewish leaders kind of latch on to because they were looking for witnesses, two witnesses that heard Jesus say something uh, that they could accuse him of. And they said, oh, he said he's going to destroy the temple, which, by the way, he didn't say. Uh, uh, um, but anyways, the interesting point is Matthew and Mark record the accusation that was made uh, searching for a charge against Jesus when he was to be crucified. They never mention, or the, those Gospels, none of the other three Gospels mention when Jesus said that. John comes along and he actually explains it later on. Uh, he, he gives, John gives context 
to what Matthew and Mark were saying about this. And, and that's the significance. And, and from an evidence standpoint, uh, this shows the independence of the Gospels. You know, we, we have four Gospels, and when people ask, why do we have four Gospels? Well, they were written to different audiences, but they actually complement each other. And, and the fact that you have these types of statements shows you, it, it, the term is called an undesigned coincidence. In, in, in other words, you can't understand the accusation that is mentioned in Matthew and Mark without what John records later on explaining it. And so, yeah, and so John does, and, and John, by the way, doesn't mention the charge. You know, John deals with other charges as Jesus is before Pilate and those types of things. So, uh, yeah. and of course, part of that was uh, they changed the charge after they condemned him to death of blasphemy. And they changed it to a totally different charge when they went before Pilate. You know, so uh, so you, the hypocrisy there. But I think that's a powerful thing from an evidence standpoint as to why we have four Gospels, and they do complement each other. And we need all four of them uh, if you want to get a fuller picture of various events. I think it's a good point. Uh, I want to say something about this 46 years. Mm -hmm. Where did 46 years bring us in the ministry of Jesus? Is it possible that it could bring us to the last year of his ministry to make this the same temple cleansing as the one in the last uh, last week of his earthly life? Uh, or does that 46 years bring us to actually a point much earlier than that at or shortly before the beginning of his, of his ministry? And I think that would be a good thing to look at to determine whether this was an early cleansing earlier than the one mentioned by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Any thoughts about that? Research for next week. Um, let me share this, if I can get it large enough to benefit, or not benefit, everybody can see it. Not sure if I'll be able to do that. Let's see. Yeah. So th what I'm about to share is from the ESV study Bible for whatever that is worth. They have good comments. Um, here, the great construction of the temple proper lasted from uh, 20 slash 19 to 18 slash 17 BC, but the larger temple area was not finished till AD 66. Some scholars favor an alternative translation. This temple was built 46 years ago, which would date the statement to about AD 29 or 30, since there was no year zero. So I'll just kind of share that, that there. Put it put it in early, early in his ministry rather than the late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Um, I'm trying to see. We've got one more comment that dropped in. I think that's uh, based on my comment. Okay. Based on your comment, do you want yeah, to bring it in real quick? Yeah, yeah. You you talking about uh, uh, a Javon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Javon, yeah, yeah. You know, he he makes the question there, uh, uh, and basically he's asking, is there anything missing revealed in the other books? And and he makes the observation about four hundred percent confirmation. Am I right about that, Gus? And the point is, is you got four, you got four hundred percent confirmation. Well, uh, from a number standpoint, th they're just confirming each other. You know, and, yeah. and, and the fact is, is uh, mm. one of the arguments that's made against uh, uh, about the Gospels, first of all, critics say that they were written a whole lot later. And they basically say that they drew from different sources or they, they all drew from a similar source or the same source kind of a thing. But when you see these differences in details, yeah. that kind of dispels that argument a little bit. Or uh, I mean, and, and I'm not saying that they couldn't have drawn from sources. I believe Luke did. I, I think he says that in the first four verses of Luke chapter mm -hmm. one. Uh, you know, I, this orderly account. He, he interviewed people. Could Luke have had a copy of Matthew's gospel or Mark? You know, I mean, 
Could he? I, 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 I have no problem with him having a copy of it. I don't think it takes away from anything associated with that. Uh, so so they, they basically confirm each other. So you have the 100 percent. Now, the, now to answer the other question that he had there, uh, and, and I don't have all of them in front of me, but there there are other, quote unquote, undesigned coincidence and coincidences throughout the gospel. There, there's a lot of times when we are doing something, when we are saying something or we find a fact in the gospel, uh, other gospels complement it. Uh, I'll give you one quick illustration that just came to my mind, and I don't have the exact verses in front of me, but you have one of the Gospels that basically says uh, 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 Jesus, they slapped him. This is at the trial, and said, who slapped you? And uh, you would sit there and think, well, Jesus could look at him and say, you did. But one of the other Gospels tells us that he was blindfolded. And yeah, so when you put it right. together... When you put them together, you get the you get the better picture. Even though the one gospel just just mentioned the, yeah. the you know they were mocking him and they slapped him, the, he he left out the detail about he was blindfolded. But another gospel says he was. So and, and that's why you just go through all the gospels and you find exam. There's examples all through the gospels, and not maybe not but may not be true with everyone, but virt but most gospels have. An event that is exclusive to them that is explained by another gospel. You know, for example, there's something in Matthew that explains something that Luke says. There's something in Luke that explains what Matthew says. Uh, uh, there's some, John does a lot of explaining about what Matthew, Mark, and Luke said. So, so you you've got that from a standpoint in the little bit that is repeated in the Gospel of John. So, anyway, that's that's yes. my. Is an undesigned coincidence redundant? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, well, <laughs> I, 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 I guess it could be. Well, yeah, I, I see the point you're making. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, undesigned and coincidence. Yeah. But you know, you know, yeah. tying them together. I guess, I guess you could say that. I, I see the idea. Of it is a coincidence, but it wasn't planned. Yeah. Uh, which I guess a coincidence might be something. If it was planned, it wouldn't be a coincidence. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <Exactly. laughs> um, good discussion. Good discussion yeah, right. there. Um, and I think the point to take home what, what Tom was talking about, the Gospels, they are you can study them independently. You can read Matthew and see a true image of the Gospel. Read Mark, the same. Luke, they'll all give you a true image of the Gospel. But all four together helps to even to fill in so that we have a, a fuller, if that makes sense. The gospel is the same in each message, but the details of Jesus's life is where the, the differences in gospels really help to, to fill out our understanding. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And incidentally, uh, just for help for anybody in the audience that doesn't know about this, there are there are uh, uh, what do they call them where they they tie them all together? Harmony. Uh, yeah, yeah, harmonies. harmonies. Yeah, I think that's what. And and uh, 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 J. W. McGarvey ha has is called the fourfold gospel, and it is he was from the eighteen hundreds, so it is available copyright free online. Uh, there there are there are places where you can go and you can read that, and he he just reconciles all four gospels together. Uh, in the events and puts all the the differences in various accounts. And that's just one example of it. There's there's others that have done the same thing. Okay. So. John, I thought it was interesting. You said all four. All four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good oh, point. Oh, 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 okay, John, John Duvall, bring back memories. Remember when we were in school and Shrigley, you know, Shrigley would say, uh, Two more points. Two more points. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, speaking of two more points, we're down to one more point, and that is time for our study to end. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us this week for our study. Kept you over a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, but we'll try to do better next week as each week we try to get better with 
being a little bit more timely. But if you have any questions or comments that come up that you'd like us to at least maybe answer or at least continue, maybe consider in a future study, you can send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. You can also email us individually. You'll see the email addresses on the screen there, john at, paul at, tom at, etc. truthfactor.com. Use that extension there on the, um, or that URL for the email addresses there. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you have to think about things. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to consider them. All right, any other thoughts or comments? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me again today for this Bible study. Thank you, folks at home, for joining us as well. Bob, Jeff, you have something? I appreciate you starting this and maintaining it and inviting me to participate as well. Well, thank you. See, he thanks me. The other guys take me so much for granted. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> I hate that for you. I'm kidding. All righty. We'll see everyone next Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time here at truthfactor.com or truthfactorlive.com. I think they'll both get you to the same place. Follow us on Facebook, Truth Factor Live, YouTube as well, Truth Factor Live. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.